I'd had the courage to say no back in February when this monstrous political scheme was first ordered. There are a lot of moments in the Senate scandal, times that have set the whole country talking. But two of the key ones in the so-called Duffy Wright affair happened back on February 11th and 13th. Meetings were held behind closed doors. Decisions were made that have staggered the Harper government and led to gridlock in both the House of Commons and the Senate. You can be sure a lot of Conservatives will be talking about it all this weekend in Calgary. Some of what happened is on the public record. Some isn't. Tonight, we go behind those doors, trying to put those two moments in some context. This is the Langevin block, just across the street from Parliament Hill, home to the PMO, the Prime Minister's office. It was to this stately 130-year-old building, named after a Confederation-era cabinet minister who later had to resign due to scandal, that Senator Mike Duffy was summoned on February 11th to meet with Stephen Harper's chief of staff, Nigel Wright. He walked in the Langevin front door just past noon, went to the second floor, entered a boardroom, room 204, near the Prime Minister's office. This picture of the Prime Minister sitting in his office, talking with speechwriter Arthur Milne, was taken on that same day. Duffy and Wright were meeting on the same floor. Wright had a blunt message for Duffy. In spite of assurances he had made just a few months earlier that Duffy's housing allowance arrangement was acceptable, a series of media stories on expenses had changed everything. It had now been decided that the party's highest profile fundraising senator had become a liability. So now the Prime Minister's top aide was saying there was a problem, a political problem. Duffy said Wright would have to pay back $30,000 and the Prime Minister wanted it done quickly. Duffy argued he'd done nothing wrong, that Wright himself had cleared him, that he'd followed Senate rules given him when he was appointed. The PMO speaking explicitly through Nigel Wright and after checking into my expense claims wrote to me on December 4th, 2012, Mike, I am told you have complied with all of the applicable rules. When none of that worked, he asked to see Harper. The Prime Minister was just down the hall, but instead Wright said he'd arrange a meeting in 48 hours time. On leaving, a shaken Duffy ran into Finance Minister Jim Flaherty entering the Langevin front door and explained what was being asked of him. Flaherty just shook his head and walked on into the building. Two days later, on February the 13th, in a different room inside Parliament Hill's center block, the Conservative Caucus Room, where every Wednesday morning, MPs and senators meet in private to talk party issues and where on that day senators expenses was on the agenda. Half a dozen MPs got up to support Duffy including Mark Warwa, Pierre Polyev and Dean Del Mastro. They were firm Duffy had been smeared by the media and the party should stand by him as he they said had stood by the party. But the Prime Minister, without mentioning Duffy, was adamant. Those with improper expenses should pay for them or leave. That set the stage for what may well be the pivotal meeting of this whole story. From it, everything else would flow. What happened next would answer a crucial question. What role did the Prime Minister play in the decision to pay back the public purse for Mike Duffy's questioned expenses? Multiple sources have confirmed the following details. After the caucus ended, after MPs and senators had left the room, the only people left were a few security and logistics personnel and the three key figures in the Duffy Wright Harper affair. The Prime Minister was sitting behind the long wooden table at the front of the room, a table elevated on a riser so the caucus had been able to see him. Standing slightly below, in front of the table, Duffy, and just to his left, Wright. No one else was part of the conversation. Harper spoke firmly, but not angrily. 
The senator and the prime minister both agree on how the conversation began. It's just a different tone in the way they retell it. I was ordered by the prime minister, pay the money back. End of discussion. Nigel Wright was present throughout, just the three of us. Mr. Duffy now says he is a victim because I told him he should repay his expenses. You're darn right, I told him he should. Yeah! But there was more than that said in the meeting. Duffy again made his case that he'd done nothing wrong, that Senate finance officials had approved his expenditures and so had Wright. Duffy claims Harper told him it wasn't about what was right or wrong, it was what was perceived to be right or wrong. It's not about what you did, it's about the perception of what you did that's been created in the media. Harper has denied saying that. Duffy says Harper claimed the conservative base wouldn't accept the public purse paying for Duffy's living arrangement. The rules are inexplicable to our base. Harper has denied saying that, too. Finally, Harper said the public wasn't buying the explanations and that Duffy had to pay the money back, period. One source says there was no discussion about where the money should come from. How did the conversation end? The same source says the Prime Minister shut it down by saying Nigel would make the arrangements. Stephen Harper's office is calling that last remark categorically false. As for Wright, he won't comment on what was said that day or for that matter anything else about this whole affair. Duffy, Wright and Harper have repeatedly turned down requests for on-camera interviews on this matter. Back in the caucus room, the conversation was over. It had lasted less than five minutes. In the nine months since, Duffy and Harper have never spoken again. Their relationship over. Only a few years before, Harper had signed this picture for the senator, glowingly adding the words, to Duff, a great journalist and a great senator. Thanks for being one of my best, hardest working appointments ever. Within days, Duffy, Wright, their lawyers, lawyers representing the PMO and the Conservative Party, and a number of party executives began a series of extraordinary secret meetings and phone calls with the sole purpose of determining how to pay the senator's bill, yet still make it look like Duffy was paying it himself. Initially, draft agreements were drawn up that would see the Conservative Party pay the bill. As Duffy continued to refuse paying it, saying he'd done nothing wrong. Plus, he said he didn't have the money anyway. Then, suddenly, the bill ballooned from 30000 to 90000 when Senate accounting officers decided some expenses claimed by the PEI senator were, in their characterization, inexplicable. Just as suddenly, the Conservative Party, while it did agree to pay Duffy's $13,000 legal bill, backed out of paying the much larger $90,000 amount, saying the new total was just too much, that it sent a dangerous precedent, that other senators and MPs would be lining up to have their expenses paid too. It was then that Nigel Wright made what would become the fatal decision. He'd give Duffy the money from his own savings to settle a debt. The Prime Minister has always said he knew nothing about Wright paying the bill. This is a matter between Mr. Wright and Mr. Duffy. But when it became public, he's been inconsistent in other statements. The Prime Minister told Canadians in this house on June 5th that no one else in his entourage knew. And to yesterday he said just the opposite. He's gone from praising and standing by his Chief of Staff for doing the honourable thing. Mr. Wright uh, said that he wanted to be sure the taxpayers were reimbursed. <laughs> to accepting his resignation, to saying he dismissed him. There is one person responsible for this deception. And that person is Mr. Wright. It is Mr. Wright. Senator, why did you feel it's important to show up today? Duffy, to this day, maintains he didn't know where the money came from, that he always assumed it had somehow come from the party. One thing he was convinced of, though, no matter who paid the money, Wright had handled the arrangements. Duffy says he was sworn to secrecy about the deal, told to ignore ongoing audits, and threatened with being thrown out of the caucus if he went public. 
The former newsman played along with the phony cover story, even, he says, memorizing a PMO phoned-in script for an interview he gave in Charlottetown about the decision to pay the bill. Everywhere I go, people are talking, well, where do you live? What's that all about? Blah, blah, blah. It's become a major distraction. So my wife and I discussed it, and we decided that in order to turn the page, to put all of this behind us, we are going to voluntarily pay back my living expenses related to the house we have in Ottawa. That line was written by the PMO to deceive Canadians as to the real source of the $90,000. So how did news of the deal get out two months later? Sir, how do you feel? Duffy says at one point he sent an email to his lawyer that included details of the deal. But he also copied a few friends and advisors. One of them, he's convinced, although he doesn't know which one, betrayed him. Could you just stop for us for a second, sir? And leaked the email, which eventually wound up in the media. Thank you, Senator Duffy. Could you just stop for us a question? It is a long, sordid story. It started around disputed expense claims over things as small as cab fares. It met its key moment around this table. And it's now reached a point where the careers of some powerful people are near ruin, where police are searching for documents, bank records, even interviewing senators' neighbors, where a government is stumbling almost daily amidst charges of scandal, and where a prime minister is having his credibility challenged, not only by the opposition, but by some of the very people he appointed to the Senate in the first place.